So uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rich Duncan. I am uh, the CTO of Black Diamond Software. Um, we have been a Jenkins partner for uh, several years. We've been doing work with uh, ALM tools for over 15 years. Uh, the latest incarnation are with you know a, a lot of the open source tools, a lot of the stuff in the ecosystem that people are using when they when they bring in Jenkins to do CI and CD work. Um, and what I'm going to be talking to you about for uh, as long as we uh, as long as we have time together is looking at some of the some of the issues with bringing Jenkins um, uh, as a tool into uh, enterprises, meaning you know larger larger companies. So um, if uh, if that's not why you're here, no, um, so that's what we're going to be talking about this afternoon. So um, a little bit of a history about us: um, we were um, a development organization solely uh, way long ago. Uh, we were approached by a company that wanted us to help them understand how to move their C code into C++. That was the new thing, object-oriented programming. We started looking at methodologies. We started looking at the symbology of these sort of things. And we rapidly kind of transitioned from a company that did software development to a company that coached people on how to do software development, which led us into methodologies, led us into ALM tools. Um, we've done a lot of work with uh, a number of, of different uh, tools in, in, in the family that I'm sure most of you folks would know. And um, I'm going to say about six or so years ago, uh, we started to see a trend in our clients where they were moving to um, open source technology, and we started to move along with them. Uh, what we really, I think, sort of noticed at the beginning was, wow, these things are, are way, <laughs> way better um, price to performance uh, than the stuff that we were, we were selling. And that is, you could do stuff with these open source tools for zero money that you were spending 50, 60, hundreds of thousands of dollars on. We also noticed that while the, 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 most, that the most common use case for these tools was small companies um, with, with not the same set of concerns over, over, over the, the way that assets get protected, or the, or the sort of the enterprise concerns that most companies that are larger have. And that's, that's sort of where we started to you know, cut our teeth in terms of, well, how do you bring in a tool? That's one thing. How do you bring in a tool for an enterprise? So if you look at our, our, our clients, um, a lot of them are, are folks that haven't used Jenkins before, or they're in a large organization, and there was a, a, a pirate team that came up and stood, stood up you know, Jenkins on a, on, a, on a notebook in a closet someplace. Um, and they're looking to, to take that experience because it was positive, and they're looking to understand what it's going to take to do it at scale. Um, at, I would say, you know, three or four years ago, it was about continuous integration, about automated builds, about turnaround time. Uh, now it's, it's really, I think, it's transitioned into we want to be able to do delivery faster. We want to be able to do continuous delivery. We see this as a part of the chain of tools that we need to bring in. Um, our typical engagement is to, is to understand a little bit more about what a client does um, and to try to understand what technologies are going to work for them, what technologies are missing from their stack, and then to start to engage with them in, in, a, in a way to, uh, to, to sort of put those tools in place. And so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about this afternoon is just some of the experiences that we've learned along the way in terms of how to do that. Um, I, I will start to lose my voice, and I will start to. It, this will go very quickly, and probably not be as much information um, as it will be if you guys can participate and help out. Because it, there's usually a lot of people that I found in this community that have a lot of knowledge, and and I think that everybody here will not only uh, not only will I benefit, but every every one of you will benefit as well if we if we can make this a little bit interactive. So I'm going to try to pause along the way. Um, how many folks here are involved in setting up Jenkins or some of these similar tools in a in a you know Fortune 1000 or sized company, could you we just show hands? Great. Okay. Um, how many folks are are in in one way or shape or form doing a continuous delivery DevOps kind of thing? Is that is that part of a big part? So I'd say probably 70 to 80 percent of the hands that were raised that said you were doing that. Um, how many folks are using Jenkins Enterprise? Okay, how many folks are using Jenkins and wondering if Jenkins Enterprise is sort of a thing that they want to be able to look at? So we have a couple of those too, we always do. How about Jenkins Operations Center, anybody? Okay, um, good. So that's, that sounds like it's the right, the right fit for this audience, so that's, that's good, okay? And I'll be kind of hopefully putting out some, some feeler questions that we can learn from. 
So what, what's the client perspective? Why does, why does a client come to us and what are they looking to, to get? And I, I'd say a lot of it is the best practices. And, and I'd say that's a lot of what we have to give because we, we've just been around a block enough. And we'll, we'll go through some of those as we go through here. Uh, performance and scalability is always an issue. Um, audit is, is, is certainly an issue. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the companies that will most benefit from these, these things happen to be in, in industries that have regulatory and, and compliance issues that they, that they have to be able to pass, have to be able to pass audit. They have regulations on their systems that also apply to their ALM systems in terms of um, can you show me that something has been changed, can you prove that you, you know who did it, and all the standard type of security audits that they'll fall with on, with, within. Um, and they're also looking, in, in almost every organization, there is no, ta very, very rarely is, is it a total tabula rasa where, uh, hey, what would you use for version control? Usually there's an incumbent for everything, and we're looking to, to, to fit a Jenkins Enterprise and maybe some other, you know, one or two other t technologies in with an existing set of tools that are being used by hundreds of developers. So that's, that's a big part from them. What are, what are some of our concerns? And I think, you know, therefore, what, what should be your concerns? Um, if, if I look at, so right away I'll make an, in, an admission that maybe, maybe as, as a consulting vendor I should make, I don't know, but I, but I will. Um, not everything that we do goes well. It's not, it's not uncommon at all to have, have projects that don't go well. So we, we try to learn from them when they, when they don't go well, and, and some, of, some of what I want to be able to present to you is what, what makes for projects that are, that are bad. I, I'd say probably the biggest one is that somebody has it in their head that if we bring in these new technologies and we stand them all up, uh, everything else after that will take care of itself. If you build it, they will come. That, that never works, so we're always concerned about about the policies and the procedures that will be in place, because there needs to be some way in, in a large organization of being able to help, help everybody understand what role they're playing and how it all works. Um, I like to use an analogy where if, if I have four or five people uh, and we're, we're playing in a jazz ensemble, um, you know, the bass player can start doing a little bit of a different groove, and all of a sudden the guitar player picks up on that, then the sax player is doing something, and everybody can operate in real time in the way that they collaborate. Now, now imagine the USC marching band, and some guy in the middle, a trumpet player, decides to turn right. We're going to have a problem. We can't do that, and that, that's the thing in an enterprise. Everybody has to understand their role. So a big part of what you need to be able to do is, is to be able to say, in your future state, what are the policies and procedures going to be that, that are going to conduct how, how people use these tools to achieve the benefit that you've intended? Um, organizational transformation is what this is all about. We'll talk a little bit more about what some of the key characteristics of that are in, in a little later on. So um, the first and foremost, um, Jenkins has 600 plus plugins. And um, one of the things that we always want to be cautioning of people of is um, do all the exploration of, of plugins that you want but um, be careful about the ones that you choose. Um, you want to make sure that in a production instance of Jenkins, you know, the plugins are fully vetted. We'll talk a little bit about, the, about what you would do uh, to fully vet the plugins that you choose. Um, you should be in, in any enterprise with any type of system. You would never experiment in production. So you should have, uh, for all of your systems in your ALM tool chain, you should have uh, at least a staging and production, if not dev staging and production or whatever, your organization typically will, will mandate that you have. And so experimentation should be limited to uh, a system where, 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 where the effects of it aren't going to be deleterious. And we've seen that. We've seen people bring in um, plugins into a production system and knock it down. So we want to be careful of that. Um, some of the things that we would want to have you consider because you're an enterprise, uh, the job config plugin is a great way of sort of keeping control on the changes that are being made. Most organizations will allow basically nobody to change the administrative configuration of a Jenkins or any of the tools, but developers or the development teams have the responsibility of, of updating their jobs or creating new jobs when they need them or, or making changes, and then all of a sudden something doesn't work and, and your beeper goes off in the middle of the night as the story goes, and, and you know it doesn't work, it broke, and it's your fault, but it really isn't because somebody made a change that they shouldn't have, and you need to be, be able to do that. It's usually an audit point for most people that they have to have that sort of stuff. Um, next, audit trail plugin. Um, so any change, any job that started, you have a chain of, of, of what happens inside the instance. That's, that's a very important thing for most organizations too. Um, 
We like, or I should say, I like the promoted builds plugin as a way of, of, of mandating a uh, promotion model during the release process of an application so that you can have your release job um, take a, an asset that you've built uh, and push it through the different stages of a process. Clearly, this is going to be uh, very much dependent on what's downstream from there in terms of the tooling that you're going to use to do the deployment with. So you have to take it with a grain of salt, but this is something that we, we, we tend to think is a really good one. Um, I have had a lot of times where, where we just needed to do a little bit of a, of a report or a little bit of a, of a, a view of the environment or something that needed to be, to be scripted that needed to look a little bit at the Jenkins model and maybe some files. And so um, from an administrator perspective, the Groovy plugin is your friend because you can do all sorts of really interesting things from a um, gathering information, you know, look, determining the health of your, of your, of your, of your system with Groovy. So uh, that's a good one to, to look at and know. Um, like the conditional build step plugin, when you, to, to put a little bit more logic inside of inside of your builds, if uh, you want to be able to, um, we use this a lot in, in where we want to template a build. So maybe the build wants to run with test cases, maybe they don't. That's a checkbox, or it's not, or maybe because it didn't produce a file, a certain step doesn't get done. Uh, so that's that's something that we find a lot of use for. Update carefully. I, I, we, we talked before. I think it's really important that you you have um, at least a, a, a staging a server, um, usually um, with um, um, n let's say not the same amount of performance. You know, so you're not going to allocate the same number of of slave executors and stuff, but enough. And, and every time you do updates, uh, whether you're updating Jenkins or you're updating a specific plugin. Um, we recommend that you do it first in a staging environment, obviously, and then do do some sample workloads on it. Don't just, hey, it booted and nothing, no errors came up in the log. You should run some sample workloads on it on, for sure. And I think that um, it's uh, it's it's important also, uh, I think, in, in terms of this, to have a policy for for when you when you do uh, new plugins. Um, how many people have any kind of policy around when they're doing updates to their Jenkins environment or or, or what constitutes the process for introducing new plugins? Got one, two, three, four, a couple. Okay, so here right away, I would I would totally recommend this because you know it just you. There are situations where we've run into where we've completely put Jenkins at a standstill because of a plugin that just you know it turns out somebody wanted it in there and you know after we looked after after it caused a problem we realized it probably had ten installs in the last year. It hadn't been updated since 19, you know, since 1990 something. Kidding, and um, you know that, that was a, it was a real problem. So you want to make sure of, of looking at that. Um, another problem that we see in shops that have a large number of slaves is is not not applying, you know, the best practices of continuous delivery to the provisioning of a slave. Um, variances in the way that your slaves are configured um, when, when a label says it's supposed to be the same thing can cause all sorts of really fun problems that are really difficult to debug because you just can't, you know, you, you know it works sometimes and it doesn't and then you realize it's because the slaves have some, some minor modicum of difference. Um, if you're, if you're, there are two real ways to do this. One is to use a tool like a puppet or a chef. Uh, the other one is to use the, the Jenkins tool provisioning capabilities to ensure that the tools are being provisioned consistently on all the slaves. How many people don't use either of the, uh, nah, maybe that's a bad question to ask because you want to be, be bad. But um, this is something you should, definitely, you should definitely take a look at for sure. Oops, what happened? And finally, um, we've seen a lot of problems happen by people just using the, the master as, a, as one of the build executors. So we generally recommend that you don't do this because it, 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 what happens is builds are very CPU and memory, CPU intensive sometimes depending on the tooling, you, it can start to eat up memory and it's definitely gonna take away performance from people that are using the console. Uh, so um, the, the, other, the other problem is when you do this, the, the account that's running the build is the same account that's running Jenkins, it's a security violation. The build can randomly go out and look at stuff it shouldn't be able to look at. So even if you want to run the builds on the master server, you have to use a slave account to do it, so it should be in a different account so that there's no, there's no cross-pollinization that happens there. Okay. 
And finally, um, you know, in terms of just general build stuff, I think it's, it's really important to try to understand you know, what, what is the service that you're offering to your clients in terms of, um, you know, for the most part, we're talking to people here who are responsible for a resource that their teams use. So what kind of bills should you be offering them and, and how, do you, how do you provide that service in a way? And, and the other thing I would note about this that we've seen a lot of problems with is be careful when that changes. I was actually uh, in, in San Francisco earlier this week working with a new client. And the problem that they had is that they, they were, it's really interesting, they were, they were, their people were doing Jenkins to solve operational issues. Uh, their operations are, are done um, in a cloud environment, uh, and they use Jenkins as a way of making sure that uh, that desired state is reached on a platform to provision groups of servers uh, so that they can be used by the development team and so on. And that's, they're, they're using Jenkins as, as a sort of the orchestration for that. Um, now they're bringing in developers who want to do CI. And it, it was a real, it was a culture clash, both in terms of resources and the way both, both of those groups wanted to use the machine. So, you know, you're gonna find your CI builds are doing great, and now all of a sudden the test team wants to jump in and they wanna run a bunch of Selenium tests, or they wanna run tests that take, you know, three, four, five hours to do a complete regression. All of a sudden that's changing your resource usage, it's changing your, your, um, the way that the platform's being used, and you have to be careful about knowing when that's happening. So we, we talk to people sometimes about sort of turning, turning yourself into sort of a service bureau within, within the group that you're servicing and sort of helping you know, them understand what you're about and you know, getting new requirements from them and sort of planning how your system is gonna to evolve to, to handle those requirements as if you're, as if you're an outside service. And, and, and of course, um, you know, I think this is obvious, but you know, there are great integrations with tools you're probably already using. You should definitely take advantage of those. Okay. So um, a lot, of, a lot of, of folks here are hearing a lot about continuous delivery, DevOps. A lot of people are actually doing continuous delivery in DevOps. And one of the things that we notice is um, that what this does Anytime you, you bring something like this together, you're not, only, you're not only bringing your development team and your operations team together and actually asking them to work together finally to, to solve a problem, you're, you're also asking all of the different um, uh, expertises that you have, all the different um, 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 types of work that are happening uh, and practices that are happening need to uh, essentially start to align uh, so that you can you can do DevOps, and this is this is becoming something that enterprises are more and more concerned about. So, um, what we've got here is really sort of a, a very simple um, choreography between um, the, the number of different assets that are involved. The, the top one, the blue box, is is your SCM system. We're just showing Git because it's it's something that we see a lot of, and more and more people are interested in. Um, Jenkins as a build server, um, uh, an artifact repository, um, artifactory. Uh, or, or, or one of the other competitors that would be involved, Nexus or um, whatever, and then um, a, a deployment platform, okay? So if you, if you, what I'm, we're trying to look at here is how, how does your choices in one, one aspect of this in, in, impact another? So we're just showing a really basic, sort of, the, sort of the most, one of the most basic things you can do with a branching strategy in Git would be a feature workflow. So you can see there, there's feature one, it's got two commits, and then finally, maybe there's a pull request, and that, that, that change is merged back in. Then there's feature two that's going on, uh, and then feature three starts, and then one ends and the other one begins. And a general trying to show you sort of in that, that Git notation of commits along a, a branch, um, what happens. So now, those choices back up into what your opportunities are for CI in, in your build system in Jenkins. So uh, one of the common things to do would be uh, if, I could, if I know that we're doing feature branch development, I, I wanna have some CI happening on those feature branches. So how do I identify those branches? Well, if you use a pattern of, of naming your, your feature branches a certain way, you can have your Git job pick those up and, and do CI on them. So if there are four or five features ongoing at a given time, if you know that they're features, you can do your CI build against them. And that's what this is showing. Eventually, you would, you would merge those features into some branch, and here we're just doing master. You would want to have another build there, another CI build. But this might be something where you're actually going to produce an artifact that you want to then put into your artifact repository and maybe now want to deploy into a dev environment. And so 
you know, the, the point here is that if you, it doesn't really necessarily make sense to deploy feature branches because they're not, they're not finished. They may not be, they don't represent finished work. They don't fin represent your continuous, you know, one of the mandates of CD is to be always continuously deployable. The thing that's continuously de de deployable here is, is your master branch if you're doing things right. So what you're going to see is, is that if you're, if you're not, if you're not under, if people aren't using the same branching strategy, you're losing the opportunity to do CI, and you're now losing the opportunity to know where, where, where the points along the way are that you can take advantage of that strategy to implement what you want to do in terms of eventually producing artifacts that are going to be de um, deployed, well, deployed into your, 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 your artifact repository and then eventually deployed onto some hardware for evaluation. It all has to line up. That's the point. There's a question. In the, in the, I'm not sure if this is how recent a feature this is, but in, in the current um, Git SCM plugin for Jenkins, you can have it watch more than one branch. So what we typically do is just set it up. Pardon me? Right. So what you need to know is that it's a feature branch, and then you can. One of the one of the um, one of the things we recommend is to adopt the Git flow convention of putting features in slash feature slash. It turns out with with branch names they don't have to be just they're actually really just file names in Git, but you can use the fact that they can be in directories. So uh, we 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 use feature branch the way that that Git flow, um, which is pretty popular, ma mandates. And in fact, there's a lot of good, um, there's the tools, several tools out there have support for this is why we recommend it. So you can basically then say, this is a feature branch because it's in the feature branch folder directory. So it must be a feature branch. Therefore, we're going to CI it because it's a feature branch. We also recommend that when the feature is uh, finally merged, um, delete the branch. It's not, it's not needed anymore. And that'll, that'll, that'll automatically cause Jenkins not to watch it. So it's a fairly, a fairly straightforward way to do it. So um, what you'll realize here, right, is, is that um, if I'm doing a different workflow, if I'm doing full Git flow, which has release branches in it for release stabilization and all the other things that are involved, my, my opportunity of, of where I want to do my, my integration jobs and my, my, my deploy jobs are going are gonna to change. They're even going to change more dramatically if I'm not using Git, if I'm using some other version control system. But the, the, thing, that, the thing that we, more often than not, when I walk into a, an organization that does branching, is that it's very common for, for, for there to be a lot, of, um, a lot of opinions about what the right branching strategy is to use on the same project. You know, where one, one, one guy's doing one thing and one guy's doing something. You, you can't have Git watch every possible branch. That would be a bad idea. I mean, you can't have Jenkins watch every possible branch. So something to look out for while you're, while you're, um, while you're doing this. And so um, practices that you have when you're doing continuous delivery need to align across disciplines so that one can take advantage of the other. Um, another thing that we're going to talk about next is this whole concept of, of, of securing assets properly. Uh, which, which is something that doesn't really come right out of the box, and we're going to talk about how you might do that. Um, and you know what we're what we're seeing is is that um, Jenkins is an important part of of your of your choreography. It's going to be used to drive a lot of a lot of this stuff and do a lot of the automation, and will be a book of record for most of it. But you also have to consider what's downstream in terms of what other technologies are you using as part of part of your deployment, which will wildly vary exactly how Jenkins will be used. So um, that's, that's a big part of it in terms of knowing what's going to be coming downstream. So um, if, uh, if you've used, let's see, you've used Windows, um, you've seen um, access control lists, um, you've, you've seen basically this, a concept of, of we have a group of things that we're calling assets that need to be protected in some consistent way. So I've just got a little bit of a UML diagram here. And the thing is that you've got collections of these things that, that apply, that need a certain amount of security on them for, for, for whatever the reason be, and, and we'll talk about that in a second. You've got assets, you've got assets that are defined, artifacts that are derived from artifacts. They, they typically need to be protected the same way. So if you build a jar from, from, from sensitive code, the jar itself will be sensitive. Um, you're going to want to define roles that define privileges. 
across, across these things? Who can, who can read the artifact? Who can change the artifact? Who can do the build? There'll be roles that are defined across those. And finally, there'll be people or systems that will be um, assigned to be in one or more roles and therefore will handle one or more privileges. So pretty much of a, a ubiquitous model, yes? So the important thing is to, represent, to know that um, one, of the, one of the big things that we see is as you're using Jenkins, um, you're providing, because of the way Jenkins works, and any, any role build system will do this, you're providing access to assets. You need to make sure that if an, if an asset has certain protection by the way that, you know, who would be able to get to this Git repository um, because of the way the security works, or who would be able to get to your Perforce or your um, um, Team Foundation server repository, whatever you happen to use. If, if I'm not able to get to the asset through the, whatever is protecting the code, I shouldn't be able to go into Jenkins, log in, go to a job where that happens to be in a workspace and browse the code. Likewise, I shouldn't be able to um, go to the um, uh, artifact repository manager that you're using and pull down the source jar or pull down the um, documentation on it or pull down the actual artifact itself. So having this level of security is important and it, and it kind of starts by understanding what, what, what the segments are that you have. This is a pretty common one where you have basically maybe two or three lines of business and um, a, a set of common assets. Um, and the, the important is, is that you have to understand these things, you have to understand how they're being protected. This gets back into the concept that we, somebody brought up before of, uh, of, of enterprise identity, right? In terms of um, when you log into Jenkins or you log into Git, you need to make sure that uh, we, we know what, uh, what AD group you're in because that's probably what's going to determine, you know, nine times out of 10, your active directory or your LDAP directory is going to determine um, what groups you're in. Those groups are going to be mapped to roles within these various tools. So um, that's an important thing. But it's important that it's consistently applied and that, that, becomes, that becomes a trick that, that, you know, just requires uh, care and study in terms of in, in each tool how you're going to put that together. Anybody have a similar situation with, uh, you know, where we have common, common assets, but have assets that are protected, maybe um, sensitive, sensitive projects, that sort of stuff? Is that a common thing that you guys see? Show of hands. A couple, okay. For the, for the folks that don't, is it because, is, is it that all the, all the projects, every developer can get to every project? How many people have that? Okay, um, anybody, so we've got a couple of people that raised their hand on that. We have a couple of people that didn't. What, what are some of the other kind of security patterns on your assets that you're seeing? Something to think about. You may, and you know what, you may not have th thought about it because it's not, it, it, again, it's, it's a sort of like out of the box of what normally uh, Jenkins installation would do, right? Well, they definitely can't be in the code base, that's for sure. Um, have you used uh, the credentials plugin much? In Jenkins, yeah, um, that might be something that to take a look at. For example, that one of the things it does is it, encry it uses encryption on the credential, and it's it's pretty good about not displaying uh, the un unencrypted password anywhere when it's used. So, and more and more plugins that need credentials are are are, are adopting adopting that as a standard. And um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, enterprise Jenkins in a second, but that's something as a feature in terms of being able to segment the credentials it can it can do for you. So that would be something I think good to look at. Um, so anyway, I think you know it would be if, if you haven't done this, it would be good to understand what these what 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 your security segments are and what you're doing today to protect them and ensure that the the protection is is defined um, contiguously continuously throughout all the tools. So I would say that you know if you've done your homework, you understand what your users want, you understand you've done all the homework about about the, the as-is state of your tooling. You've proposed good tools in your future state. You've done your job to sort of size those tools, bring in the right environments, put the right integrations in place. You've tested this out on projects. Um, you're now ready to go. I would say this is where the hard work starts. Because I think that at, at this point, the technology work has been done. Now you've got anywhere from 50 to two or 300 developers and their, and their project teams that now have to change what they were doing to what they, what they need to do now. So um, 
I think culture change is, is one of the biggest things that I see as, as, a, as, a, as, a, um, as a challenge to be overcome in order to be able to have people use these tools in, mo in, in most organizations. Again, you're always going to see that sort of the, the top end organizations with the best and the brightest, usually smaller organizations that can just pick it up because they all know it and they're all really smart. But if you look at larger organizations, they've got you know, uh, teams that come that are, that are internal teams, that are a mixture of internal teams and, 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 uh, and, and consulting resources, and people may or may not know, and people have, you know, typically just want to get their work done in the most effective way, and, and change is something that's, in most organizations, is a pretty threatening thing. So a um, couple of things that we recommend, and I think when, we, when we're trying to, trying to institute change in a larger, larger organization, we're looking at these issues. First and foremost is communicating. It's, it's surprising the number of times that people are planning these large, these large rollouts. And if you ask the people who are being impacted by them, both on the management side and on the, the consumer side, they don't feel like they know what's going on. So it's definitely something there. It's, it's almost hard to over communicate about this stuff. But you know, what would be some of the things we would recommend? Lunch and learns, presentations, um, webinars, internal webinars. Um, uh, wiki sites where where the where the where the, the the subject of the change is being communicated, and I think that's that's a hugely important one. Um, what other mechanisms are people using when they're when they're doing rollouts to communicate to the user base what uh, you know what's what's coming at them and, and how it's going to affect what they do? Yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree with that one more. I mean, you know, I'm, I, I play the role of the dude that comes in and tells you about this really cool thing that you're going to do. And okay, that's fine. You can do that. I, I, I spot that you can do that. That's not what we do. And the, I think that the best single thing you can do is take a group of, of, of some, you know, an adventurous project team and have them go through the transformation, come out the other end and say, boy, that was good. I want more. Then their peers will feel like, well, gee, if they could do it. Then we could do it. I think that's that goes without saying is one of the most important things you can do. You know, some experience inside your organization. And from my perspective, we'll learn a lot from doing that process. We'll learn what worked and what didn't work. We'll learn what things that we thought were going to work didn't, and we can start to problem solve about how we're going to make that go better. Um, next, and this is a key process and a part of it. This pilot process is create local advocates. Um, you want advocates within your development community and the communities that are affected that will speak well of this stuff and advocate for it and tell other teams that they should be using it. So it's a really important part. Um, learning from your mistakes is an important part, which is why we always recommend that you, that you adopt slowly. You want to do some, some, some small number of teams in your adoption because you will find out things that you didn't know. And you will, need, you will find opportunities or challenges that you need to overcome before you unleash this this new thing on the rest of the, the population. So we, we like to start small. We do maybe two or three project teams in, 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 as part of the adoption after having already done pilot teams. And we, so uh, anybody recognize what that is, working in small batches? I'm giving a hint here. What is that called? What do people call that? Iterative. Iterative. It's agile. It's, it's lean. It's, it's working in small batches, right? So don't boil the ocean. Don't, don't, hand the, don't hand the platform out to 300 developers. I mean, you wouldn't develop code that way, so don't do your, don't do your, your rollout that way. Use those, use those agile lean concepts, and, and you, will, you will learn. And you know, at some point, what you realize is, ah, we didn't learn anything on that one. Awesome, because that means maybe you kind of got the closure, and now you can, you can go for scale, and you can roll out a little bit more. And I think, honestly, uh, the, the, the last one goes without saying. At some point along the way, you're going to need a whip. You're going to need somebody from an executive who, who, who sees this as a mandate and aligns with it. If you don't have that, that can be tough. That, we, we've actually seen projects where um, um, somebody in, the, in, the, in the, the chain of command thought this was a good idea. Um, but you know, jobs are ephemeral. The, the gentleman got moved to another part of the organization. His replacement didn't have the fervor for it. So, the whole adoption and brand new, brand new stuff that we've been working on for nine months came to a grinding halt. So it's always good to make sure that you've got the sponsors in place. So what would you say are things that I forgot here? I mean, what, other, what are the other important things to do when you're rolling out this kind of technology in your organizations? 
Uh, you know, your first point was really good. I, we, <laughs> it's, you, could, you could stand pat with the first one. We, we were doing work to actually take a, um, a group of people that were using Ant to do their builds with, and they wanted to use Gradle. And everybody understood the Gradle, but what really, what really did it was, here's what Gradle is for people that do Ant. And here are the things you're going to do differently and why that's better. And people just sucked that right up. You, you had a point. Um, using the same, so what, what, what we find is that these efforts are, are very much like the same efforts that those teams are undergoing as they try to service their end client. And what they would typically do is something like a, um, a project sponsor who reviews a backlog, or maybe you give back, you know, so you're, you're looking at product backlog items essentially. So how do you groom your PBL? You know, well, maybe what you do is you vote. Maybe what you do is your executive sponsor comes along and decides those things. But I think it's it's through it's through communication uh, with um, with the target community that you establish what these what these priorities are, and you try to get them in some sensible order. Which doesn't necessarily mean the thing that most people want. If the team that's funding the thing is has got a, a really important item and they're the only ones that want it, and they're paying for they're paying your freight, then you'll do that. But that's, that's why I like to, to think of these, these efforts as you being your, your, own, um, your own service bureau within your organization. So, you know, essentially sort of intra, intra, in, intrapreneur. You want to make sure that you're kind of keeping everybody happy, but you're, you're you know, looking at priority. You're looking at uh, who's important. You're looking at what got the most votes and, 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 and doing it that way. That's, uh, that's what we find to be the most effective. So, other questions? Okay, um, we are uh, sad to say all done, but thank you so much. There were great questions. I think it really helped, and I, I appreciate it, and I'll be here to talk if you want. Thank you. <laughs>